Hi, uh, I'm Avil. Uh, I live in Prague. Uh, work for a company uh, named Starkware, and uh, we are basically uh, doing zero knowledge proofs. Uh, currently, uh, um, gener like our main target is uh, provide with solution of zero knowledge for uh, of zero knowledge proofs for um, the blockchain industry. And a little background about myself. Can you hear me well? Perfect. A uh, little background about myself. So I have a technical background. Uh, I did electrical engineering and physics, and I worked eight years as security researcher. And but since 2011, I'm involved in several different uh, blockchain projects. Uh, I'm doing product here. So this uh, lecture will be mainly about different. Uh, use cases for of start for ethereum and there is going to be less math and i guess that uh, most people in this room they know something about zero knowledge proofs maybe something about stark uh, does anyone here doesn't know what zero knowledge proofs are okay okay so uh, I, I will go maybe um Roughly because I'm starting by comparing Stark to uh, several uh, zero knowledge proof systems. So, um, the main idea of zero knowledge proof system is that uh, basically, okay, the, uh, before zero knowledge proof systems, what you, uh, when you wanted to verify that some computation uh, happened correctly, then the only way that you could do it was to rerun the computation. Uh, now that you have zero knowledge proofs, you can do two things. First of all, you don't have to rerun the computation in order to verify that the result was correct. And in the case of Stark and Snark and some several other, other uh, proof systems, you don't even have to run uh, in, a, in the same time of the computation. Actually, uh, the verification time of the computation is now much shorter than the computation itself. And this enables you to do a uh, few cool things. The other uh, idea of zero knowledge proofs, like the other part, there is like zero knowledge and proofs. So proofs is what I just mentioned. The zero knowledge part means that you don't have to reveal all the inputs of the computation in order to verify it. So someone can come to you and say, hey, I know an input for a SHA-256, and this input generates output that starts with 50 zeros. And before, you had to reveal what your input is, and now you don't have to if you're using zero knowledge proofs. This is like three sentences ex explanation about uh, zero knowledge proofs. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm just, uh, these two slides, perhaps a few of you have seen them in the past. It's basically a simple uh, comparison between three of the more famous uh, zero knowledge proof system exist. Uh, and there are SNARKs, uh, Bulletproofs, and Starks. And what you see in the graph is basically like, um, it's very simple in traditional computation. Uh, the running time uh, for the prover and the verifier were, this, were exactly the same as the uh, running time of the computation. And uh, most people in the room probably are familiar with SNARKs. And in SNARKs, the verifier runs uh, in actually fixed time or almost fixed time with a computation. And it's actually faster than the computation itself. And the prover running time is longer. There is overhead to run the proof uh, for SNARKs. And uh, now, also, some of you. Now, bulletproofs, now the main drawback of bulletproofs uh, compared to Stark and Snark is it's not succinct. That means that uh, both the prover but also the verifier, they usually take to run longer than the computation. And with Stark, the situation is quite similar to Snark. The prover is somehow faster, and the verifier is logarithmic with the running time of the computation. Uh, to put some numbers, uh, so if you're looking, if you're looking on uh, prover time, then for prover for a computation that takes for Stark 
one second to run uh, the prover on. Uh, for ZK Snark, it will take about eight seconds, and this is this is actually experiment done on two machines. One is single core and one is multi core. So the comparison between Starks and Snarks uh, was on the same machine, which is multi core, and the comparison between Starks and Bulletproof is on the right side. So it's single core in both cases, and you can see the Star Prover is about ten times faster than the Snarks one, and that the Star Prover is 100 times faster than the bulletproof one. And when it's come to the verifier time, so, uh, by the way, those times that mentioned here for Starks are coming from the academic code. So this code is available on GitHub, and it's not very well optimized. And you can still see that the verifier time for Starks and Snark is about the same, while for bulletproof, it's something like 1,000 times more slower. So the drawback of this is that uh, when, you when you want to use uh, bulletproof or anything that it should be succinct, it's very hard to do so. Even if you want, uh, there were a few talks about using bulletproofs uh, for range proofs uh, in confidential transaction. I don't know how many of you heard about it, but then when you think about it, that even because bulletproof is not succinct, uh, the time to verify 1,000 single uh, uh, proofs of bulletproof is um, like it makes uh, some of the application really hard to implement. Okay, uh, so uh, another comparison, this time the space, and here you can see the Stark has main drawback uh, because uh, the Stark proofs originally from the paper they are something like 500 kilobytes. Uh, we did manage in not something like three, four months of uh, work to reduce this number to 80 kilobytes, and I really hope, especially as doing the product, that we will be able to take this number even another um, factor of five to 10 more, but it's just wishful thinking. And yeah, okay, so this is the number for one uh, proof of shin one shielded, shielded uh, transaction. And when you compare it to Snark, so in Snark the proof size is fixed, is something around 200 bytes. And in Bulletproof, uh, the size is about 1.5 kilobytes, so still uh, much better uh, than Starks in this category. Uh, but what's just important to notice is that uh, when you go to, from proving one shielded transaction to a batch of 10,000 shielded transactions, then the proof size only grow to less than 200 kilobytes, and now you can prove 10,000 shielded transactions, and this time uh, you're not paying uh, linearly, not in the verification time and not in the proof lengths. And in Snark, it of course will still be 200 bytes still, and in Bulletproof, it's also growing logarithmic uh, with the size of the proof. Uh, one thing that I didn't explain here is that in Snark, there is a key generation for every different circuit, for every different NP statement that you want to prove. And the size of the key that the prover holds is growing linear with the size of the computation. So if the size for uh, the key of the prover now in Zcash, for example, is 900 megabytes, and I think that in the uh, next uh, sampling, they are going to do it something like 40 megabytes, then still when you want to prove 10,000 shielded transactions, you have to uh, keep in memory a key which is 10,000 times larger. So this is a major drawback aside from the uh, trusted setup. Okay, so there are many, many potential uses uh, of Star for them. Uh, do you have any questions so far? Okay. Uh, there are many potential use cases uh, of Stark, either for Ethereum or for blockchain. I want th this this uh, one hour that I have. I'm going to talk specifically about shielded transactions. I do uh, want to mention two other uh, use cases that may be relevant to some of you, and uh, there are much more. I'll be happy to talk about the other use cases later, and also. Uh, on Sunday, we have um, uh, the sharding day, so there is 
uh, there are also few relevant use cases there for Starks. So basically, um, some potential uses of Stark are, um, and I'm talking now both on second layer and as a, a base uh, layer. So uh, s the first thing that you can talk about is scalability solution by batching. And what I mean here is that basically, if you think about it, there is, um, okay, there, the, you, we can talk about scalability in two components. The first one is the uh, transmission. What do I mean by this? When you're sending transaction, most of the time you are sending metadata or the data that you need to update the DB. And also together with this, you are sending some proof. And this proof is coming in a way of, for example, signature. And the signature taking um, like sometimes more than 50% of what you're going to transmit. And you can save this uh, up to logarithmic saving in Stark. And I will get into it more detail in the next slides. Uh, the same with computation, because basically in Ethereum, uh, the idea is that, or one of the ideas is that, uh, in order to verify your computation, I'm going to have to run it. And so, if somebody uh, sends a transaction, this transaction costs 500,000 gas, then uh, he cannot, like the the way he cannot put too many of those transactions inside the block because. He expects that each and every node in the network is going to uh, run the same computation to validate that his computation was done correctly. And what you could do with Starks, you could, you could say, okay, instead of sending 1,000 transactions that each of them spent 500,000 gas, I will send one transaction. This transaction would prove that the computation done correctly for all those 1,000 computation, and it will... Uh, only what it will do, it will give the data that you need to update in your database and a proof that you can run in really short time and cost that shows that this, the computation that you are declaring about was done correctly. So it gives a lot of uh, scalability mostly on the computational side. Uh, two more things to mention. Um, so bootstrap and syncing. Basically, I, I'm, I'm sure some of you heard about it. Um, Right now, to, to synchronize the, in, in, in full trust, to synchronize blockchain, what you have to do is you have to download all the blocks yourself and run all the computation yourself and then get to the final state and then you trust it. But instead, what you could do, as some of the clients of Ethereum doing with trust, is you can say, okay, um, I don't want to download all the blocks in the block state, uh, in the blockchain. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, to download, for example, let's say that I know already um, block five million in the chain, and I want to uh, sync fast. So what I can do is I can say, okay, let's download the latest block. This latest block will come with come will come with a proof that the state transition coming from I don't know block five million to this block is correct. And then you don't have to download all the blocks in the chain and you can be, um, you can gain the same level of trust uh, for your thinking, but much faster. And I will get into it also, I have a slide on this uh, right away. And the last potential use case is uh, the more famous one, uh, it's donate for pri donating for privacy, is uh, the one of shielded transactions. Now, I know, I'm, I'm sure, like I'm going to uh, talk about it more um, in the following slides. This will be the main topic, but I just want to mention that um, there was previous attempts to do it on Ethereum, and the main problem is that um, the, like privacy solutions are very expensive if you try to run them as second layer. So we want to present ID here to use Starks to generate privacy solution, which is uh, possible to use. It's not expensive, and it has um, good throughput, I would say it like this. So uh, let's go uh, like a little bit more details on scalability. Um, so as I, uh, as I mentioned, there are 
two categories. Uh, the first one is uh, transmission, and the second one is computation. And when you think about transmission, you can do few things, not just two, but um, I'm mentioning two here because they are the more simpler ones, and I, uh, I'm sure that some of the audience at least know them. So the, the first and comparable trivial uh, thing that you can do is do, you can uh, work without signatures. So suppose that until now, each and every transaction had um, sender, receiver, amounts, and signature. The signature is proving that uh, the sender um, did send those coins to the receiver. Now what you could, if you have thousands of those transactions, the signature is probably is taking, taking more than 50% of the space that you are going to transmit. Now what you could do instead, you can say, okay, I have those thousand transactions, there is still uh, the data of sender, receiver, and amount, but now I'm going to take all those signatures and I'm going to generate a proof. And this proof is going to say, for those thousand transactions, I've seen a valid signatures. And this proof is not very, the, the circuit itself is not very small, uh, but once you generate the proof, it's going to be almost fixed in size, so it doesn't matter how many transactions you are including, and the validation time will be almost instant. So you're basically now able to send more transactions in the same space. If you think about Bitcoin, for example, just uh, as a very simple example. So in Bitcoin, you have a block size of one megabyte, and let, let's talk before SegWit. You have a block size of one megabyte, and something like 50% of this block size is signatures. So what you could do to speed both transmission and verification time is to save all those signatures and have the miner generate a proof that those signatures are valid, and then the proof will weigh much less than 500 kilobytes. So there is substantial uh, save in the transmission and also in the verification time of the block. And okay, another um, uh, somehow familiar uh, use case is the one of uh, that use stateless, stateless uh, client. The basic idea to implement on, as a contract is the following. So actually, uh, when you uh, have a payment system, you can either save the balances on-chain or save the balances off-chain. And if you want to save the balances off-chain, you can keep on-chain just the root of the state of the accounts. And now what you could do is, uh, say a thousand people want to send transactions. So they are sending a, tra a transaction, they are sending the signature, so this we already mentioned how we are going to drop. And they're also sending a Merkle pass that shows that they do have uh, the value in the, the balance that they are claiming to have in their accounts. And this Merkle pass goes to the state root. Now, the problem with this implementation is that if 1,000 transactions sending 1,000 Merkle pass or 2,000 Merkle pass, then either the block is going to be very big and transmission uh, costs on the network are big. And what you could do instead um, is to use the same scheme, but instead of using Merkle Pass, have some uh, proof that you've seen 1,000 Merkle Pass to this state root, and you know that the new state root is, let's say, thank you, is, uh, let's say, the old state root was A, so now the new state root is B. And then, you are not storing anymore the state on the chain, you don't have to do costly updates or stores, and the verification time is really, very really fast. So if I need to uh, take a uh, like estimation of the saving that you can get, so by removing the signatures, you are getting a scale of about two times more to the throughput, and by removing the Merkle path, you still have to send some data, so then you can get something like 10 times more asymptotically to the throughput. The second uh, use case is somehow uh, more uh, simple to think about, um, 
And this is the one that compresses compu compress computation. Excuse me. <coughs> Yes. Um, so, yeah. so those computation times in order to um, those computation times and benchmarks that you mentioned in the beginning were they for the size that we're roughly talking about here or something else? Oh, so so I took a. Uh, um, I, the, the, I took one point, we have actually a table, and this table is very, very detailed, and it goes for pretty large computation. You can see part of it in the start paper, if you go to the graphs, uh, you will see the proof running time, verifier running time, and proof size. And so there what you've seen uh, was uh, about the size of one Schiller transaction. So, if you want to find the time that it will take for 1,000 Chile transactions, prover time is almost linear, is t log t, so it's almost linear. You can go to the, to the tables in the start paper, or you can calculate it yourself from this presentation, but what the number that I presented was for one Chile transaction. Okay, so the second use case is uh, in scalability is computation. Uh, does anyone heard about uh, probabilistic micropayments? Yeah? Okay, so, so perfect. So the basic idea is, you can, I, I like to think about it more as lottery tickets, basically. So the idea is that um, instead of uh, generating payments that each and every one of them has to be claimed on chain, what two parties can do if they want the streaming payments they can uh, decide that wants to pay um, is going to give lottery tickets as payments. And this lottery ticket has, let's say, the chance of one to 10,000 to win. But he cannot cheat with the probability of winning uh, of the lottery ticket. So basically, I'm paying, so let's say uh, uh, side A wants to pay side B uh, in lottery tickets, so he's paying him one, two, ten, one hundred thousand lottery tickets. And the nice uh, thing about this scheme is that the other side is all the time, he knows that he's being paid, but uh, from 10,000 payments, just one is going to be claimed on chain. So this is, this is the, 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 the main idea. The reason that I'm mentioning it here is that um, claiming winning tickets can still be expensive in gas cost. Because, excuse me, because there is a lot of um, computation involved, then easily uh, the cost per ticket can go for, let's say, 100 to 200,000 gas per ticket. But it's really just to prove that the ticket is winning. So what you could do instead is you could add to the um, lottery ticket verifier contract, you could add a Stark verifier, and this Stark will say, okay, I know to verify a batch, let's say, a batch of 1,000 uh, lottery tickets. And then what you would do, you would generate a proof for all the valid tickets. For every 100 or 1,000 valid tickets, you will generate one Stark proof that proves their validity together with the number of the tickets. And then you can submit one proof to the chain, pay, uh, something that is almost fixed in gas cost and have your thousand tickets validated much less than uh, what it would cost to, to be uh, separately. And th there are many more uh, other use cases here. You can think about some use cases of crypto kitties, uh, for instance, where each transaction was 300,000 gas, they could maybe implement it differently uh, with stocks. Okay, I'm, I'm, I want to talk about bootstrapping and thinking. So I have a simple example, which is uh, not probably very relevant for, uh, like, it's just an example, and then there will be the um, second slide, which is a little bit more relevant. But let's say that um, I'm uh, writing a light client. And I have a problem because for, uh, uh, 
for every day that uh, I want to sync, let's say that I wasn't in sync for one month, and now I want to sync my light client, then I have to download about, I, I took here rough, rough numbers, so I'm not sure if that they are the correct ones, but let's say that I want to download something like uh, three megabytes of headers per day, just to know what is the latest, um, what is the latest block header. And for some, um, for some users, for example, if you have your light client on phone, maybe it's too much. So what you could do instead is you could um, have some entity, doesn't it can be uh, nodes, but can be also entity outside of the blockchain to, gen to generate the proof that for, let's say for each day, for every day, just as checkpoints, that every day the uh, one block, you generate a proof that this block has behind it such and so amount of uh, proof of work. And then, when you give this block and the proof that this block specifically has this amount of proof work behind him, the client can sync much faster because you only need to download this block and maybe a few others after it. But he doesn't need to download um, all the blocks in the blockchain now or all the block headers in the blockchain. And a little bit more complicated from the perspective of the prover is to do the same for blocks. And now what you want to do is you want to take, it, for example, for instance, Ethereum blocks and you want to prove that they are valid. That means that you want to prove uh, that the computation done in the block is valid. So you can do it for every block, you can do it for once in thousand blocks, you can even do it recursively. And but. The point is that uh, the, now the amount of uh, data need to be downloaded and compute in order to uh, fully, with full trust to validate the latest state, state sorry, is much, uh, much, much lower. And the verification time will be much faster. Now, what, is, uh, what, what we need in order to generate these kind of proofs so, I don't know, uh, how many of you knows a little bit about how Starks uh, works? No? Okay. So, uh, um, okay, so roughly, um, I, I will give a really uh, high level explanation. Thank you. Yeah. yeah appreciate it. Okay. Uh, I, I, can, I can very much recommend on the uh, lectures and blog posts that I put on the uh, as the sources for this lecture. You can take a look later. They are not very complicated and they are fun to watch, in my opinion. <laughs> my opinion. Uh, yeah. Okay. It's working now. So um, I just an idea, when, I, when you were talking about light clients, and uh, I didn't think about this before, but essentially we're all talking about these non-interactive proofs, right? Snarks and Starks are both non-interactive for good reason, but I now think that there is actually value in interactive proofs as well, in the context of light clients, because the light client could actually pay for the proof and the proof has to be such that the light client cannot resell it later. It, the proof has to be unique. It, the proof has to be as such that it can only be used by somebody who paid for it and not with anybody else. So you cannot basically extract it without revealing some of your secrets or something like that. It's just a, it's a, it's a bit of an off topic, but um, um, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so explaining starts really fast. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. So, so basically, okay. Uh, the easiest way to think about it, for me to think about it, is the following: um, computation is just a trace. Trace. Uh, let's say that I'm putting memory on the side now. Okay, there is no memory. So, computation is basically a trace. Um, each level on the trace uh, tells you what the state of the registers are. 
Okay, you represent it like this. And then uh, the next step that you are going to do, you are going to represent um, in each, uh, let's call it uh, stages, so or, or rows. So each row you're going to represent, um, you are going to create basically a constraint. This constraint is going to be um, polynomial, and this constraint is going to show that the transition of the computation from the previous row to the next one was done correctly. How is it going to show it? Because it's going to be zero exactly for this uh, transition. So if you have, for example, you can think about ad addition. So then the constraint is going to be zero just if the, uh, the result of the next row was the correct result of the addition of the previous two registers in the previous row. This is uh, roughly uh, the ID. So now you have all those constrained uh, polynomials and they represent your computation. And to the next part I'm not going to enter, but there is some polynomial tricks to, to force the knowledge of this comp correct computation to uh, make the constraint to be zero over the whole computation. And this verification that you do know the correct uh, polynomials that uh, when you submit them inside the constraint polynomial give zero, this check is comparable uh, fast and easy to verify. There is another one, uh, hidden dragon there, which is low degree testing, uh, you want to prove basically that you are using polynomials and not something else for this equation, but uh, this is more complicated part. But Stark is basically this, and now what it means is that every, each and every computation, you, are, you have to, to uh, transform to a constraint system. Okay, so by the way, what they did in the Stark paper, they, they didn't took specific anti statement just, they implemented a constraint system for uh, something that's called tiny RAM. It's basically um, a full uh, language, so there, there are uh, not, not, not a huge set of operators, I think something like 30, but you can, uh, and they, they also implement memory, I think. So we can do the same probably for the EVM, it's not going to be really a uh, short uh, uh, mission, but it's possible uh, to be done because it's already, I, I don't know how many opcodes are in the EVM and how, how many of them are actually complicated and not basic ones, but I'm pretty sure that uh, it can be done also for the EVM exactly it was the way it was done for the tiny RAM. So yeah, w once you have this, then you can, once you have the constraint system for EVM, you can basically uh, prove um, that some state of some block was computed correctly and you don't have to download or re-download all the blocks uh, in order to verify that the current state is the one that you've been given. Uh, more questions about it? Have you looked at uh, like usability of constraints in like constraint solver queries, for example? So could I like generate a Z3 proof and then have a snark that that proof is actually true? Uh, you mean uh, recursive? Like, sorry? Y you're talking about recursive proofs? Um, no, 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 I'm talking about like one proof. So like a uh, standard constraint, uh, like expression libraries, like SMT lib or something like that? Uh, no, I, I don't know about them, but I will say something that in snarks, uh, they are using R1CAs. Uh, R1CAs are rank one constraint systems. Mm -hmm. And in Starks, you can use polynomial from the first degree, but uh, it's actually saving, uh, saving to use polynomial of higher degrees. And we call them heirs, and um, I think that the only, the only uh, place that I know that you can read about them is in the Stark article, mm -hmm. for now. Uh, I hope that at some point we will have a, a DSL or something like that for those constraint systems as well. 
Cool. Thanks. Okay, so uh, I'm going to take one use case a little bit in more details, uh, including gas costs and so on. And uh, this is going to be the, the use case of uh, shielded transactions. So first, what, what we want to do? Um, Sorry. So um, what we want is to create a contract this contract will be over Ethereum, and it will be enabling um, shielded uh, transfers of value over Ethereum. Now it can be shielded uh, transfer of Ether, it can also be a shielded transfer of any ERC20 that the contract is supporting. And the way that you can think about it is that there is some contract, if you want to move your token or Ether to uh, shielded mode, what you are doing is you are deposit or mint your tokens in this contract. The contract has a pool of this token. And since once you did it, you can uh, privately transfer this, um, this value in a, inside the contract. So let's say that Alice put uh, I know 10 uh, Ether or 10 DAI to the, to the contract. Uh, so the first, um, the first minting or deposit to the contract will be, of course, uh, viable. It will be not private. But since then, Alice can transfer her uh, their, that value secretly or privately inside the contract. And once she finished, uh, she can, of course, withdraw outside her tokens from the contract. Okay, so this is, this is the basic idea. Now, what you have to, of course, implement is the shielding inside the contract, right? Because you want to enable that if someone holds value inside the contract, then it can, uh, in a private way, transfer this value to another one person, okay? So there was one previous attempt. I, I um, okay. Pre uh, one important question: uh, How many of you guys know at least the basics of how uh, zero cash or zcash are working? In basic. Okay. So I will give like a really brief about it. I just wanted to mention that there was already one uh, attempt, and this attempt include. Um, basically implement uh, some pre-compiled uh, uh, contracts for SNARKs. They were not implemented in a way that you can, in one, uh, in one, op in one contract running to verify SNARKs, but they were like a little bit uh, more native uh, operations, basically elliptic curve operation uh, done uh, as pre-compiled contracts. And they get to a number of two million gas uh, for one snark to be verified. Uh, there, are, I think that if you want to implement shielded transaction, on top of this, you have two main problems. The first one is that um, to do one snark verification takes about two million gas, so you wouldn't get far with your throughput there. And the second one is that if you want to change the NP statement. Like, I, don't, I didn't mention it before, uh, SNARKs basically need a trusted setup. So, and what you can do is you can use someone else's trusted setup, assuming that you're trusting his trusted setup. Okay, it was, yeah. So, what you could do over Ethereum, you could use the exact NP statement used in, in, in Zcash, uh, and then you, could, you don't have to generate your own trusted setup. But even if you change this, uh, NP statement a little bit, then you're going to have to regenerate the trusted setup again. So it's a little bit hard. Yeah. Is this like no longer true? Is this no longer true with like the powers of Tau scheme? Because I think that setup. With what? Is, 
the, the powers of Tau, the new multi-party computation-based generic trusted setup? Like, if you have a multi-party computation uh, that you trust, then, then yes, you can regenerate it. But I don't know, I, um, I don't know on a snark setup that you don't have to create your uh, multi-party uh, multi computation in order to generate the setup. So I think the, the Zcash has like a global setup that's going on right now that can then be used to instantiate any uh, circuit that you want. Yeah, I, I just say, I'm, I'm just, I'm saying the following. You do have to generate a trusted setup. Yeah. You can do it using Zcash or you can do it yourself. You know, as long as the people that are using your system trust in this trusted setup, then, mm. then it's possible. Uh, Multi-party computation, by the way, it's another topic. I will be happy to discuss it later. Uh, the downside and upside and of this. Sure. Uh, okay, I wanted to give really a short, pre, uh, uh, really short explanation about how Zcash works because it's crucial to explain uh, shaded transactions. Let me see. Okay. So I'm, I'm gonna give, give now a very brief and definitely not most accurate uh, explanation of. Um, how shaded transaction uh, works. Um, so, okay, I don't have a detailed slide about it here, but um, here's the basic idea. Uh, every time uh, that you want to store value, you are storing it uh, in a commitment, okay? So commitment basically says uh, this value belongs to this public key, okay? This is the first thing to understand. All the commitments, they are stored in one Merkle root. And so, in order to prove that you have value, you should prove that you control, that you know Merkle pass from, the, from some root in the past to the, this, the commitment that you want to use. And you need to sh prove also that you know the secret key that fits the private key behind this commitment. Yeah? Is this part clear? So the way to do it in zero knowledge is when I want to transfer value, instead of saying, hey, I know this commitment with this value and this public key and hide the secret key of this public key, instead of doing all that, you are saying, hey, I know some commitment in this tree, some tree, you are giving the root of the tree. So I know some commitment in this tree, and to this commitment, I know the public key. So this is how you are basically spending without revealing uh, how much value, because you are not revealing the value behind the commitment, or who is spending because you are not revealing the public key behind this commitment. You basically not reveal the commitment that you are spending, you are just saying, I know on one commitment in this commitment tree. Does it make sense so far? Yeah? Now, um, so the proof basically proves few things, and I will repeat on this later. It proves that you know the commitment, it proves that you know the secret key that fits to the commitment, and it also proves that as uh, the much you spend, like the, the spender side, the sender and the receiver, they are getting the same value. So no value created or destroyed. Okay, the only one problem left to solve, or not only, but one major problem left to solve, how does one prevent me not to say two separate times, hey, I know a commitment in this tree, and then five blocks later say again, hey, I know a commitment in this tree, and use the same commitment. Or in other words, how to prevent double spending. So the way that it's being done, there is a unique nullifier uh, related to each commitment. And when I spend the commitment, I, I'm not going to show which commitment I'm spending, but I am going to reveal a nullifier related to this commitment. Now, to go back from the nullifier to the commitment, it's not, uh, it's, it's hard or it's not possible, but you, you, uh, part of the proof is to show that this nullifier is related to the commitment that you are spending. And so if I spend nullifier, if I showed nullifier one time, I cannot use it again. 
This is consensus rule, it's not part of the proof. Okay, so again, when I want to spend value, I'm proving in zero knowledge that I know on some commitment presented before belong to some root. I know the secret key that fits to this commitment and I reveal a nullifier that also fits to this commitment and this nullifier I show to the blockchain. So I'm basically saying, hey, I spent some commitment, you don't know which commitment it is, but here's the nullifier, I prove to this nullifier belong to this commitment, so this shows that I cannot uh, spend it again. Okay, this is the basic idea. So every time that I want to make a shielded transaction, I'm presenting nullifier for commitments that I keep in secret, so I'm saying, hey, I know nullifier, these are the nullifiers of commitments that I know but I'm not telling you. Here's the proof that those nullifiers does related to those commitments, uh, that I know the secret key related to those commitments, and that I know uh, a pass from those commitments to some root presented in the past. Okay? And the way to create new value is of course to generate new commitment. So those new commitments will be added to the commitment tree, and the person who will get them will be able to spend them. Okay? Now, what's not in this picture is that if L is transmitting shielded transactions, wants to give value from to Alice to Bob, then Alice needs this she sends on chain, but she also needs to tell Bob to tell Bob, hey Bob, you have new commitment with your public key on it and this value. So there are ways to do it on chains and way on chain or way to do it off chain. The, but the basic idea is is the basic idea clear? I have a question about it. So th this is the uh, uh, payment scheme being used uh, is based on the zero cash model and it's being used in Zcash. Okay, let's go back uh, one slide uh, back. So we have three players in uh, in this uh, scheme that I'm going to present. The first one is the user. The user uh, he wants to pay. He wants to generate a transaction. He wants to he wants to generate a shielded transaction. So what is what is he doing? He's running a prover and submitting a star proof uh, to the contract or to the proof service. We will talk about it in a second. But basically, the user is the one who wants to uh, create the shielded transaction. There is the contract. The contract, uh, he plays the roles, if you think about Zcash, so he plays the roles of the role of the miner. Basically, he is on chain and he verifies a single or batches of shielded transactions or start proofs. Um, the way that you can imagine it, imagine that you um, you want to implement a shielded transaction on Ethereum, what you are going to do, you are going to create the logic that stores the Merkle uh, root of the commitments, you are going to create the logic that makes sure that a nullifier wasn't spent more than once, and you are going to create the logic to verify those proofs, right? Once you have those three, you are able to um, have a contract that runs a shielded uh, transaction system. Okay, so the user and the contract are known or uh, familiar players. What we are adding here is a prover service. And the idea of this prover service, it doesn't have to be trusted. He also cannot censor uh, transactions. What he can do, he can uh, take multiple uh, shielded transactions, so he doesn't know uh, to whom those transactions are paying, but he can take a bunch of uh, shielded transactions and generate for all those transactions together one shielded, uh, uh, one proof. So he's going to send, okay, if, if, if each transaction sends, here's a nullifier, nullifier, here's uh, a commitment, a, a new commitment, and here's the route that I'm counting on, and here's the proof. So the, con the prover service is going to submit to the contract. Here are thousand nullifiers, nullifiers, here are thousands new commitments, and here's a proof that all of those are correct. Okay, so what, what does sender need to prove? He need to prove that 
the input coins or the commitments that he is spending, they exist and that he owns them, meaning that he knows uh, the public key related, the private key related to them. He also knows the nullifiers that related to them. He also needs to prove that the sum of the inputs and the outputs is equal, that he is not creating value or deleting value, right? And this is done in zero knowledge, so that means that there is no uh, uh, data revealed about on the input coins, on the values, public keys, everything remains secret. And what's going in the transaction as the data are the nullifiers and the new commitments. Okay, questions so far? Okay, so the part of the contract, as we said, the contract needs to verify that the proof that she the transaction is valid. So this is one part, you can think about it on on-chain or contract function that calls uh, validate and it gets proofs and data and validated the proofs does correct when run on the data. And besides that, he also needs to do his consensus work, meaning he needs to verify that the nullifiers hasn't been presented yet, so they are not being uh, they are not uh, spent more than one. And he needs to update the relevant states on chain. So, for instance, if you think on the case uh, of miners in Zcash, then every time that they get new commitments, they need to add them to the Merkle uh, tree in order that future uh, payers could prove that they know com those commitments, right? Yeah? Questions? Okay. So how does it look? Just a little bit of uh, uh, technical details. N nullifiers are 256 bit, and the way that we chose to implement it is that they are being stored on chain in memory, and future contract calls can check that they are. If if they are getting nullifiers, they can check whether this nullifier has been presented before or not. And so. Uh, the way that uh, one can implement it is that uh, to store the, nulli the nullifier by using single store operation and to check in that the nullifier does not exist, it's another load operation. Okay? Now, uh, for commitments, the situation is a, bit, a little bit more complicated. We don't want to have the contract store the entire Merkle tree. Why? Because it's expensive. Instead, we want the contract to be able to verify that, um, it, that commitment, when he gets proof, he gets a proof that says, hey, I know root, and to this root I know commitment, but I'm not telling you which commitment it is. So the contract needs to be able to know all the, to, to know all the roots before, but we don't want the contract to store the entire Merkle root. So there are a few ways to do it. I'm presenting you one that I think that um, I like to present it because I think it's nice and it's definitely not the only one way. Um, okay, so the way that we will do it is the following. Remember the problem that we are trying to solve is that we want um, to get commitments. Let's say that we are getting I don't know, 1,000 commitments in a block, and we want to be able to verify later that those commitments exist somewhere, even without, uh, we don't want to store the whole Merkle tree in memory, okay? So one way to do it is, uh, uh, it has different names, I will call it uh, forest of Merkle trees, uh, just because it's easier that way. And when you implement it in this way that I will explain later, that basically all the contract needs, needs, needs to know are the roots of the uh, Merkle trees in the forest, and there are something like if you, there are something like logarithmic in the number of commitments that you want to store eventually. So, in, in, if you are using this um, scheme, which I will show like right now then you can, uh, for a single commitment, to pay just for in two updates on average, 
And if you have 1,000 commitments, you still pay with something like 10 updates on average. So uh, basically the price that the contract will pay on the commitment stays uh, almost fixed. Just a fixed number of updates, doesn't matter how many commitments it receives. Now the prover, he needs to know the, he still needs to show that he knows the uh, in all commitments after it's been added, but as you can see, it will be comparable easier for him, and he just needs to know uh, a single point in time that it's been added. He doesn't have to uh, keep watching the entire state. Okay, so the way that commitment forced can work is the following. Uh, the contract only keeps in storage uh, the roots that you see, okay? Now, how is it going to work? When contract gets the first commitment, it's going to store it in the root. When he's getting the second commitment, notice that he is now use, he has in memory just the first commitment. So when he gets the second commitment, he is now, he's now going to create a larger Merkle tree, and he's going to store again just the root. He doesn't remember anymore, not C1 and not C2, he just remember the root, okay? The next commitment is going to sit here, so he's going to remember it. Want to guess what's going to happen next? Yeah, so basically, the fourth commitment, when it will arrive, the contract only need, and verify it yourself now, that the contract doesn't need to know C1 or C2 in order to add C4 to the, to the, to the forest. All it needs to know is C3 and H1 plus two. Agree? So basically, it enables the contract uh, just to remember a fixed number of elements and to still be able to maintain a whole, like a full uh, Merkle forest, or it can be also a full Merkle tree. But it's important point that now the contract doesn't have to do all the hard job of storing the entire Merkle tree in his memory, okay? And it's continued the same. If there is coming the fifth commitment, he's going to put it in the root. When there will come the sixth commitment, he will take the previous root and connect it together, and then he doesn't remember anymore the entire uh, state under the roots. He just remember the roots, and so on. Okay, so you, you get in the idea, but the more important to understand from this scheme is that uh, for the commitments, the new commitment that arrives, we don't need to hold the entire Merkle tree in memory, it's enough to keep fixed amount of element in memory, in storage, sorry, and it, so it enables us to reduce the cost, basically, to something that you can work with. So to sum it up and uh, tell you a little bit more about the costs. Okay, let's assume that in one single uh, shielded transactions there are, on average, two nullifiers and two commitments. So, um, transmission costs. So I'm talking now about start, yes? So the nullifiers, commitments, and roots of the Merkle tree that you're going to prove that you know commitments from, they are together 192 bytes. Now the start proof currently for one shielded transaction will be 80 kilobytes. So it's, it's going to lead the cost here, and the transmission cost in total will be 1.5 million cars, so pretty high. Uh, computation cost of running the verifier is 400 kilo, uh, uh, 400,000 uh, gas. And we also have storage cost, uh, which three stores to store two nullifiers and one root of the entire commitment uh, forest, and two updates of the roots in the forest. So in total, we will pay for one shield single, for single shielded transaction, something like six million gas, which is pretty high and uh, not very practical. Okay, um, so we introduced the prover service. And the idea is that prover service is a service, can be a few of them, doesn't have to be one. And what it knows to do uh, is to submit proof for a batch of transactions. So. You can think about this model as such. Users sending their shielded transactions, prover node sees them, and batch those shielded transactions together. 
So the prover node will still pay uh, to sending one proof to ch on chain, but now we can be paid separately for every transaction. And the work that he's going to do is going to take all the 100, let's say, 100 proofs in the batch and create from all those 100 proofs one proof approximately in the same length, and that's it. And so basically, in the cost of a little bit more of one shielded transaction, uh, you can now send 100 shielded transactions. And so it gives a very, like, it's, it compresses the cost, sorry, it compresses the cost of a one shielded transaction by a lot. Uh, how much, or how exactly uh, is this compression effective? So, when we are talking on 100 uh, shielded transactions, so you can see the number, the proof is going to be a little bit larger, 125 kilobytes. We also have the linear component of the transmitting the nullifiers, commitments, and truth. Computation cost of running the verifier will stay almost the same, so 500,000 gas. And we still have linear cost in the storage because we want to remember, mainly because we want to store all the nullifiers that we are getting. So, in total, it will be 14.5 million gas, and then the average cost per transaction is 145,000 gas, which is effective compression, compression of 42. So, okay, this is already much better. We still have, of course, you can see um, the point that to put 14.5 million gas in a block is not possible right now. So there are several um, ways to solve it. The best way, which we hope to get there uh, soon, but it's not promised, is just to make the proof smaller. And this is uh, what we would like. This is like the best case what would happen. But there are a few other options, and there are the following. We can uh, split the proof to several blocks. It will still work. We just, the latency will be um, like a little bit high, sorry, a little bit higher, but the cost per transaction will still be 145,000 per uh, gas. So this is something that we can do already now. Um, another two things, we can, uh, there are a few improvements which are not uh, quantum resistant and they will make the verifier probably a little bit more expensive, but they can take down the cost the, the length of the proof roughly by factor of three or four. So this we can already use maybe today. And the third option is to, to use interactively, be, in, interactive proofs, because as Alexei mentioned short, briefly or shortly before, um, what we are talking about here is non-interactive proofs, it means that you submit a proof and the verifier can verify it immediately. But there is also a variation, which is a little bit shorter with the proof, that you can work interactively with a verifier. Generally speaking, meaning in our case that we just need randomness from uh, outs outsource. So if there would be some random beacon in the blockchain, then it's something that also enables us to take the proof shorter. Okay, so I just wanted to present the idea of uh, prover service and how this can cut down the cost uh, for stuff for like shared transactions or others. And I hope it will be become soon um, like actually possible and implemented on the Ethereum uh, network. It's mainly uh, the main cost right now is the problems and we are thinking about a few ways how to solve it. Yeah. Questions? I'm sure that this is not a problem just for my own understanding. If I want to send a shield of transaction and want to use the prover service, uh, I, cannot, I cannot hear you. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Hello? Is that better? Yeah. Okay. So I'm sure this is not a problem, but just for my own understanding, 
If I want to send a shield transaction and use a prover service, I understand that it can decrease the price, but it would likely increase the time that I have to wait if we're only batching 100 transactions at a time, correct? Yeah, that's, so it depends. If we have a, a small enough proof to put in one block, then the latency will be not very high because um, prover service can actually do part of the work parallel, and so um, even if it gets 1,000 transactions per second, or 1,000 transactions, it wouldn't take so much time to generate the combined proof. Okay. Yeah, but from the point of the larger proof, if you need to split it uh, in several blocks, then it will take the latency of those several blocks. So sure. if you split the proof, let's say, to 10 blocks, uh, then you're going to have to wait 10 blocks to your transaction to be included. Sure. And can you talk just a little bit about BLS signatures and how they apply to... Yes, so, so on Sunday we have... Um, there is the uh, sharding day, and uh, Eli and Uri are going to be here as well, and I guess we will talk a little bit more details on this, this case. Uh, are you aware of uh, any voting system that works in zero knowledge and uh, allows the participant to recast their vote to, so in sort of eliminating the uh, double spend, allowing double spending? Uh, can you repeat for the, first part? Purposes? the first part of the question, please? Are you aware of a voting system that works in zero knowledge? Like that currently working or some design, sorry? Designs, perhaps. Um, there is design um, of a voting system that works in zero knowledge, but the design, what it intended to do is to let, um, the idea is the following, okay? You let, you, you let a third party to count the votes, so this third party, he sees the votes, but uh, you verify later uh, that he was counting the votes correctly. And each user can verify that his vote is there and that his voice vote is correctly calculated and nobody else outside of this third party can see um, the, what, what each and everybody voted. But the prover does need to see the, the votes, like in this design. So it's possible to do it, for example, with prover node. Everybody will send their uh, voting to this prover node, and he will generate the result of the vote and prove that this result is correct, and let each and every user to check that its its vote is actually there. Um, and this can be done in zero knowledge, comparable, easy. We actually uh, there are several use cases for this design. The only drawback, of course, is that if the third, if the, if if there is no, like, you, you have to reveal your vote at least once to the prover entity, yeah? In some use cases, it's very, it's okay, but not all. Um, hello. So, um, I had the, it's not a kind of question, it's, a, it's a probably another just idea that I had when, while listening to, so when you describe this, this, this mechanism for updating a commitment, and as far as I understand, uh, in that scheme, you are trying to optimize for number of uh, storage operations you're, trying, you're doing, right? Yeah. And, uh, and the reason why you can do that is because you don't really have to, you can organize the commitments in any arbitrary way because you don't ever have to prove the non-existence. You only have to prove That's the correct. That's, for that's nullifiers, the however, it's important to be able to prove non-existence because you have to prove that nullifier has not been spent before. Yes. And so in your current construction, the verifier is actually the party who updates the, the nullifiers, right? So essentially there's only once per transaction verification. But I thought now that what you could do is that you could use a data structure like a sparse Merkle tree where you can prove non-existence and the verifier will receive the the, the, the roots, like a previous post roots, 
And the, the, another proof of that is uh, the structure has been updated correctly and then it might uh, reduce the yeah, that, That's true, it can reduce dramatically the, the costs, but it has a drawback and this is why we are not using it. Uh, this implementation, what we presented, uh, it's, it can work with several provers. So it doesn't have to assume one batch at a time. Can the verifier can get five batches of transactions and he will be able to manage uh, itself correctly, okay? Because, and the reason why he, why he can do that is because if he gets, if the same transaction appears in two different batches, then he knows not to include the second one that he will receive. He doesn't have to, he can get, he can um, verify the batch, accept it, but what he doesn't like, uh, remove from it. So essentially so, what you're saying is that, that you can verify them in any order, yes. but with what I just said, you have to verify, they, the transaction yeah, can and, only be created. And you can only verify one batch at a time. So if we are taking, if for example the miner is proving, or if we force to have one batch per block, then you can do uh, even more magical things, because you don't have to send or store uh, some of the stuff that I just mentioned. But it's a stronger um, assumption that uh, we, we didn't want to take in this presentation. Oh, okay, so if you have something like account obstructions where you can pay miner for doing stuff, you can probably implement this, right? Yeah. Okay, so I eventually finished all my one and a half hours. So thank you very much for... Uh, <laughs>